believe. Um, today, we're very lucky to have uh, Jus Shan Tung, a postdoc in the Knee Lab, who I believe did his PhD at Michigan State Uni, and in August will be joining as a uh, North Carolina State University as an assistant professor. Um, today, Jus Shan will be talking about using optical transport to analyze spatial transcript determinants data. Uh, so whenever you're ready, Jus Shan, take it away. Okay, I, I, <clears throat> you need to make me the co-host. Oh. Should be good now. Sorry about that. Problem. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Are you seeing my entire screen? We're seeing. We're looking like at the, the notes. speaker notes. Yeah. Okay, I will need to share part of the screen. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction, and I'm happy to hear uh, to be the last speaker here to talk about. Uh, something we did here about using optimal transport, which is a, I think it's quite popular right now, a geometric data analysis methods, uh, which have been popular in deep learning community. And now uh, we're now using it for uh, basically two tasks, uh, one for integrating spatial data with uh, single cell RNA sequencing data. And also we found it useful for analyzing cell-cell communication in the spatial context. Okay, I, I'll give a brief uh, summary of the current popular spatial transcriptomics data sets or techniques. All right, I think the most popular one would be this uh, Visium data, a uh, Visium technique that uh, is available through 10x uh, genomics. So it basically, for this particular example, it measures uh, 30,000 or so genes in 2,700 spots. And uh, but by spots, it means it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a bead with a diameter about 55 micrometers. And the distance between each neighboring bead will be 100 micrometers. So it's quite coarse uh, resolution. And also there are a significant part of the tissue that's not covered uh, by the beads that ca captures the RNA uh, molecules. Right, and another one that I think is the is that achieved the better balance between resolution and coverage is this uh, slide seek. It's still not single cell resolution, but it can measure uh, thousands of genes in thousands of spots, and each spot will have a a size that's similar to a single cell. So it's basically we can think about the 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 cells are like a bunch of glass balls compactly placed in a 2D space. And then you place another layer of glass balls that captures the MRA uh, molecules in the first layer. Although there's not a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence, but it's still uh, uh, quite good. And another very, very, uh, another technique called Seek Fish uh, by Long Chai in Caltech now can measure roughly the transcriptomics level gene expression with a super with a, a subcellular resolution and of course so uh, we can group the molecules in each cell to form the single cell resolution data right and as you can see the drawback is uh, it covers uh, much fewer cells than the other than the other two techniques and this graph is actually a, a concatenation of uh, five independent experiments they basically take uh, small batches and then glue them together. So as you can see, there are uh, different drawbacks of this spatial transcriptomics data uh, in terms of the resolution comparing to single cell RNA sequencing. And we also have uh, some other valuable, but uh, I would say worse data sets, like uh, the, the spatial data with all the transcriptomic uh, throughput, like uh, OSM fish that has a very good spatial resolution, but it's very few genes. And even the traditional uh, staining data, for example, these ones of uh, Drosophila embryo, 
that are even measured uh, that that are even measured on different replicates, right? Although they have a similar geometry. So now our goal is to kind of integrate spatial data with the single cell data sets uh, to somehow uh, use the advantages of the both, right? So we can now uh, infer spatial information for single cell data, or we can impute gene expression information for spatial data uh, using, right? So our basic problem is we want to construct a coupling matrix I think this is the common goal when we do data integration, right? A couple of metrics between the spots in spatial data and the cells in single cell data. And of course, uh, for this, this is a common task if we think about using the common genes measured in the two data sets, right? So I think any general integration methods can, can do this. For example, Scanorama, I think uh, is talked about in previous uh, talks in this series. And we're thinking about something uh, a little bit uh, extra information, right? Can, can we use some extra information in, for example, the spatial data sets? Uh, for example, the spatial proximity between the spots to improve the coupling matrix. And also can we uh, use some, uh, incorporate some physical phenomena when we couple in the two data sets, right? Because uh, intuitively, if you have a cell that is, similar to so many spots. Of course, you don't want to map it to all the spots that are similar. You want to uh, choose the most similar one, right? So that's, uh, that is something related to optimal transport where we can control the conservation of mass of the cells or the spots, right? And uh, here's a picture I took from Axel's survey paper uh, to show the, the, the things that we, that we can do when we have a pair of cells, a pair of data sets from the same a biological system. So uh, if we go, if we use single cell to help uh, spatial, to help uh, ST data, we can impute gene expression and we can better annotate cell types in spatial data. And in the other way around, we could, when, once we have the paired spatial data for a single cell data set, uh, we can estimate the spatial origins of the cells in space, uh, in this, in, for this, in the single cell data set. And also uh, we don't even need to create a explicit quantization of cells, right? We can just create an implicit metric space for the single cells by simply uh, approximate the spatial distances between the single cells, right? And uh, here's a more specific example I'm gonna show in this tutorial. Uh, this is uh, the first problem that we looked at uh, this is a Drosophila embryo. So on the left is the spatial data that we have. Uh, we uh, this is a stage six embryo. We basically have 6,000 cells and we have 84 genes. So in the spatial side, we have a 6,000 by 84 gene expression matrix. And we also have a 6,000 uh, 6, by three uh, coordinate matrix for the spots in the spatial data. And on the right side is our uh, quite old single cell data set that only has a thousand cells with 8,000 genes measured, uh, of course, with no spatial information. So the things that we want to do is, uh, of course, analyze the spatial patterns or the, uh, some activities between cells uh, during this uh, embryo development. For example, we want to determine uh, the spatial origins of the single cells in, in the actual geometry of the embryo. And once we determine the spatial origins of the single cells, we can use that to at least partially reconstruct the spatial, the, the spatial gene expression pattern in the original geometry of the embryo. And in the other way around, we could also infer spatial distances between the single cells using the spatial data. And once we have that, we can then for example, subcluster the cell types in single cell data to distinguish those uh, spatially co-localized subclusters, right? And of course, we can also use the spatial distance between single cells to constrain uh, our uh, inference of cell-cell communications between cells. Okay, and uh, before going to the uh, practical parts, I'm gonna give a very brief introduction to uh, optimal transports. Uh, 
So uh, basically, uh, why we're using this. So uh, basically, uh, uh, optimal transport is uh, in the traditional setting, it finds a coupling between two distributions. Uh, for these two particular uh, distributions, they are, we're talking about the discrete version. So the two distributions can be regarded as two histograms. And in our cases, we can think about the two discrete distributions as two direct measures or direct distributions uh, with uh, each cell or each spot being a location in the histogram. Right, and so, so the information we have is these two histograms uh, representing the two data sets. And we also have a cost matrix that kind of measures the dissimilarity between the two uh, data sets, right? So for example, this uh, cost matrix M, one particular location of the cost matrix M measures the dissimilarity between, between the certain, between that particular spot in the spatial data and that particular cell in the single cell data. Right, so our goal is to find this gamma matrix so that, uh, of course, it's a non-negative matrix so that the total, the, the so-called total coupling cost is simply the element-wise multiplication of the matrix gamma with the cost matrix and then sum all the elements together. We minimize the total transportation cost and also require that the marginal distribution matches the, the original distributions of the two data sets so that the row sum of the gamma matrix equals alpha and the column sum of the gamma matrix equals beta, right? So as a result, uh, if M is the dissimilarity matrix between the two data sets, then the gamma will give us a coupling matrix. You can think about this as a kind of improved coupling matrix because if you take the inverse of M, it's another coupling matrix, right? So gamma can be regarded as an improved coupling matrix between, between the two distributions so that intuitively a cell won't get matched to so many spots and the spots won't get matched to so many cells that will have a control over the mass, right? And that's uh, not enough. So uh, this other formulation is where we can use the additional spatial proximity in spatial data that in addition to considering the inter data set dissimilarity, we can also preserve the intra data set distance uh, when we uh, find the coupling matrix gamma so that uh, basically we'll promote the mapping of a pair of spatially closed cells to a pair of uh, similar cells in single cell data. Right, so as a summary, now we just, uh, I'm just putting the names of the data sets. Now we can see, consider the two discrete distributions, one as the spatial data set, the other one as the single cell data set, right? And the object we found uh, from this process will be the coupling matrix, the optimal, or, or also called the optimal transport matrix uh, between the two data sets. So, so in terms of matrices, we will get a N spot by N cell matrix. And each element in this matrix reflects the likelihood of a cell and a spot being like the same thing, right? And of course, you have you you, you might have noticed that our this this will be the last equation you see in this talk. Uh, you will notice that we have a too strict requirement for mass conservation uh, when we when we, when we uh, use the traditional optimal transport formulation, right? So we require the marginal distributions to exactly match the, the original distributions of the two data sets. But that's of course not desirable because we often, uh, the two data sets are, have a significant uh, overlap in terms of the biological system, but there are also uh, distinct parts that are me not measured in the other. So uh, to, to address this, we basically developed a new optimal transport method that we call, that we have used many names and we were finalized with this uh, so-called supervised optimal transport. So basically what it does is uh, it relaxes the requirement that the marginal mass has to match each other. And by doing that, we're now able to in, 
to use introduce infinity entries in the in the cost matrix, which was not doable in the original optimal transport formulation. Right. So with the infinity entries in the cost matrix, we will be able to uh, manually like uh, inhibit certain couplings between a pair of cells and spots that are so dissimilar. Okay, and I uh, will see that this is also this also solves another problem when we have multiple species in the two distributions. Uh, currently, we only have two species, right? One is the single cell data, the other one is the spatial data. But if we start to use optimal transport to uh, study cell cell communication, we could have and, and multiple receptor species, and I will talk about that later. So as a summary, our data, our original input data for the, for the method looks like this. We have three matrices. One is the cell by gene matrix for the single cell data and the spot by gene matrix for spatial data and a uh, spatial coordinate matrix either in 3D or 2D for the spatial data. And we would need to do some pre-processing to get three dissimilarity matrices as the input for the optimal transport uh, algorithm. The dissimilarity matrix between the cells and spots in the single cell data and spatial data, the dissimilarity matrix within the single cell data and the distance matrix within the spatial data, right? And the output will be the so-called optimal coupling matrix of uh, the size and cell by and spot between the single cell data and the spatial data, right? And once we get that optimal transport, optimal coupling matrix, if we uh, normalize it along the rows and then multiply it with this XSC matrix, we can readily predict all the genes in, spatial, uh, in the single cell data now in space, right? And uh, for example, we can do a cross validation within the spatial data, use, uh, try to use the single cell data to predict the spatial expressions as a validation. Uh, this is the nice figure in the main paper. And of course the bad ones are hidden in the supplementary. So if you look at individual genes, uh, there are still genes that are not accurately predicted, right? Uh, for example, this guy here. But I would say is, uh, for most of the genes, it's uh, qualitatively correct. Of course, some are not quantitatively accurate. Uh, hey, uh, yes. Could I, could I ask you a question? Can, uh, maybe go back one slide, but um, did, maybe I, I, I missed it. Did, I, I know that you talked about different types of spatial transcriptomic platforms. Which one did you guys use? Uh, we don't care. You don't care. So you, you can use any platform. Yeah, as long as uh, we have the two matrices, the gene expression matrix and the coordinate matrix. Okay. 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 I got a question. Yes. Um, what characterizes the genes that were, that were um, well predicted versus those that were poorly predicted? Is there like a common thing between the two? Uh, in the benchmark, we do, we have the ground truth and we just use a bunch of common metrics, like, uh, we binarize the, 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 the gene expression and use, uh, AOC under the ROC curve mm -hmm. or some uh, experiment correlation such that the scale doesn't matter. And, uh, only, uh, only the rank matters and also Sorry, some, uh, naive RMSE. So my question, I guess, was like, what makes those fig um, those genes that you've shown in the main figure figures so like good to be like, why were those, why were the predictions for those so good versus all the ones in the supplementary figure? Like, is there a common characteristic of the gene expression? Oh, no, I just randomly picked some genes with different patterns. Okay, so it could be in the data itself that it was just difficult to like predict the expression or map the expression of it. Yeah, I, I think uh, one thing related to your question is if you have a gene with all the ground truth, it's hard to tell whether the prediction is uh, accurate or not. Yeah. Without exactly. any knowledge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's a caveat that when we look at individual genes, yeah, 
the predicted spatial expression of individual genes is not guaranteed to be accurate. Right. But I do think if you look at groups of genes, like a, like a module, it should be pretty accurate. Right. Because you look at the figure, it doesn't look that bad, to be honest. But I understand quality, quantity. Uh, I did numerical PDE. One bad panel will be bad for me. Okay, I understand. <laughs> I look at our infinity norm. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, aside from that straightforward application, we could also further uh, use optimal transport again to infer the distance between the single cells, right? If you consider the that n cell by n spot coupling matrix, each row of that matrix can be regarded as a spatial distribution of a cell, and if we compute the optimal transport distance between these spatial distributions, we can get a, basically a in cell by N. And with that matrix, we can do, uh, we can, uh, it can be a substitution of the gene expression similarity matrix when we analyze single cells and we can do all sort of uh, similar things. Like a U map a visualization of single cells now with the spatial distance as the input pre-computed metric. So that in the visualization, cells are, that are close to each other means that they are spatially close to each other, right? And with this uh, cell by cell distance matrix, we could also subcluster the cell types to, to find the cells from the same cell type, but with different spatial co-localizations. Uh, for example, this uh, cluster 3.1 is hard to see. Uh, 3.1 and 3.2 are both of cell type 3, but they are located in different locations. And uh, everything I talked about can be done using uh, this bunch of code here. We basically initialize the, the object, find the transports, the optimal transports plan, compute the cell cell distance, and do the cluster. Okay, here's just another example uh, of a bigger data set uh, to show that this works with huge data sets. Uh, for this mouse visual cortex single cell data sets, uh, on top we have the UMAP visualization of the single cells using the gene expression similarity. And on the bottom we have the UMAP visualization using the inferred spatial distance between cells. And you can see even with the UMAP, a visualization, it shows the layer arrangements from uh, L2 to L4, L4, L5, and L6. And also it shows, uh, uh, we have a prior knowledge that this bunch of cell types are uh, actually mixed together in space. And uh, unlike the UMAP on gene expression space, on the UMAP with the single cell, uh, with, with the spatial distance, we'll review that uh, observation, right? And uh, some other useful things about optimal transports, we can use it for a third time now to quantify the difference between spatial expression patterns of genes. So for this example, it's still for uh, Drosophila embryo on top, we have each node is a gene. And two connected nodes means they have a similar gene expression pattern in terms of measured by optimal transport, right? And with that metric, with that uh, gene by gene similarity me um, measurement, we can cluster the genes and find uh, representative spatial patterns of each gene cluster. So that's the basic analysis that we can do uh, with optimal transport when we apply it to a pair of spatial data and single cell data. So any questions before I move on to cell-cell uh, communications? Um, on the previous slide with the, um, yeah, this one, why is the performance so bad for the macrophages via MC cells? Like those tiny clusters in the bottom. Um, what, what do you mean by performance? They're not uh, together with the other cell types? So does that mean that those cell types aren't like intermixed with the other layers? Like, are they actually spatially like far away? Or... That's a good point. That this could be a artifact of UMAP 
or it could be the spatial distance is not correct. Yeah, because I'm, I'm not yeah. sure which is this. Because the takeaway from that plot tells me that if you have cell types that may be closer together and also like similar, like for instance, I think of like epidermal cells in the skin, you are more likely to do better with predicting the position of those than say if you had like Langerin cells, like immune cells in the middle of them, right? Because the yeah. gene expressions would be very different. Yeah, in the original data, all this should be like uh, connected at least. Okay, cool. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, it's a small artifact anyway, as she said, which is wondering. Yeah, so, so that's a nice point. This gives us, a, it seems that for smaller clusters, the location might not be faithfully represented. Right, gotcha. Cool. Um, you have a question in the chat. I can read it out. Um, uh, I can see the chat. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, actually, we started with this work after listening a talk to a uh, by sorry i don't know how to pronounce his name but uh, a work that used optimal transport to join the uh, real temporal point single cell data you mean the shebinger paper right yes yeah so yes it can be applied and of course uh, there were quite a few drawbacks in that original work, and they are starting to solve those drawbacks with more like uh, with novel optimal transport uh, formulations. Okay, so uh, here's another problem that we're working on. Have another, okay. So another, uh, uh, I think a very interesting application once we have the spatial proximity of high throughput gene expression data is to infer the cell-cell communication now with a spatial context, right? Because you can imagine most cell-cell communication has a limited spatial range. And uh, a straightforward approach would be filter uh, the cell-cell communication network that we inferred from single cell data with with uh, whatever uh, method that are devel uh, developed for single cell data uh, with the spatial distance. Uh, but our, our goal here is uh, we're asking, can we incorporate more physical phenomena here? For example, a cell can talk to a limited number of other cells, right? It can, uh, it can release a limited number of ligands and, it, and uh, a certain amount of ligands can bind to a limited number of receptors. And also, like uh, for example, ligands can have a antagonist that we need to somehow model the competition between ligands that competes for the same receptor, or vice versa, uh, different receptors competing for the same ligand. Right. So, uh, and to that end, uh, we use optimal transport again but uh, with some uh, custom modification of optimal transport. So that, uh, again, optimal transport has a, has a way to conserve the mass so that we can assure that a certain amount of ligands will only contribute to a certain, to a limited amount of receptors and vice versa. And with this new formulation of op optimal transports, we will be able to uh, incorporate the Phenomena that uh, multiple species of ligands can bind to multiple species of receptors. So for this example here, uh, for example, we could have three sources. Uh, we can regard this as three ligands and four targets, for example, four receptors. So that a single ligand can bind to multiple receptors and it's uh, not necessarily a complete graph a complete fiber-type graph, it can be, it, it can still be uh, individual pairs or more interconnected. So uh, translating this into optimal transport, we can use this so-called collective optimal transport. So previously we only have two species in the, in the vertical and horizontal axis, right? So now the only difference is now we have multiple species. We have, three species in the source distributions and four species in the target distributions. And there are certain pairs of 
uh, species that are not able to be coupled because uh, like uh, naturally that pair of like receptor not uh, binding to each other. Right, and as a result, uh, we can both uh, uh, in this uh, cartoon here, uh, we can reflect the phenomena that two ligands compete for the same receptor. And also when there is not enough ligands, we cannot fulfill a certain amount of receptors. And also that there is a spatial limit uh, when we talk about uh, ligand receptor binding so that for example, this ligand two that's only expressed here won't bind to receptors here. So that's why this uh, complex plot here does not have anything uh, down here. And uh, this is also something Axel did. So uh, it's hard to find benchmarks in this build. So uh, we decided to build some simple physical model that simulates the basics of ligand receptor binding. So we simulated a diffusion, a free diffusion of ligands, binding dissociation between ligand receptors and also degradation. And uh, once we reach the, I would say a near stable state, uh, we have a distribution of the coupled uh, ligand receptors for each pair of species, right? So uh, we see the case, the, Optimal transport result on the bottom uh, correctly reflects the observation from the PDE models. And in addition, uh, in optimal transport, we can also track which ligand actually contributes to the complexes of uh, ligand receptors. And also we did some more simulation to, uh, and also some quantitative uh, validation of this. We are randomly simulated many cases. So we simulated, I think, 10 cases where we have different number of ligand and receptors. We have different coupling patterns, like sparsely coupled or densely coupled. And we have some quantitative measurements of how faithfully the optimal transport can recover the distributions of, uh, of the ligand receptor complexes of different species. And basically the uh, collective optimal transports uh, outperforms the traditional one that, uh, that looks at uh, a pair of ligand receptor at a time without looking at them all at the same time. Okay, so those are the dry theory and here are the uh, tutorial for this part. So for example, uh, for the second part, I have read uh, the API style by Scampi. Uh, if you don't know it, it's like a, a counterpart of Surat in Python that does uh, mostly or almost everything that Surat does in Python. Uh, so I followed the same uh, API style and the same data structure. And basically for this example, if we want to analyze the, uh, for example, the DPP signaling pattern in, in spatial data, again, for the Drosophila embryo, uh, we just need two things. The first thing is this and an data object that uh, we obtained by uh, in, the, in the last step when we integrate the spatial data and single cell data. And, and all we need to tell the algorithm is the pairs of ligand receptors that, for example, a, a ligand can bind to multiple receptors and vice versa. And also we need to decide a, a spatial, a, a distance threshold for spatial signaling. And this part I skipped, but uh, we do have a function that estimates this spatial limit. Uh, if you have downstream genes of the, of the signaling pathway. So the, the first line designs, uh, defines the ligand receptor pairs. The second line find the N spot by N spot matrix for the communication. And the third line here interpolates that N spot by N spot uh, like a graph into a spatial vector field that we can easily visualize the spatial trends of signaling. So for this, this example on top, uh, we show that the spatial 
the DPP signaling is basically uh, from the top to bottom, from the ventral to the dorsal, while the, on the bottom we have the wind signaling that's more like from anterior to posterior. So that's a, a certain type of visualization that we can do. Uh, this is quite similar to SC velocity. It's just the arrows here means the direction, the spatial directions of signaling in terms of uh, differentiation. And uh, after getting the spatial vector field, we can also like just as we find spatially variable genes or highly variable genes in single cell data, we can now find uh, differential cell-cell communication directions in space, right? Using some autocorrelation, uh, autocorrelation measurement for vector fields. Like for this example, we can identify regions in the spatial data where there is a consistent spatial signaling direction. And also like uh, many methods, we can do some permutation uh, of the spatial spot and can, uh, can and uh, collect these in spot by in spot signaling matrix into a, a cluster to cluster signaling matrix, which we can visualize in either the original geometry or uh, some abstract graph layout. And also, uh, all these are also implemented with a similar API as ScanPy. Okay, and we can also do some other downstream analysis. So with this uh, single line. Uh, after we have uh, and uh, have the have run this line, the space uh, in spot by in spot signaling matrix, we can run this downstream analysis uh, where we can find uh, differentially expressed genes with respect to cell cell communication. So this is quite similar to a differentially expressed genes along pseudo time, right? If you the only difference is that instead of uh, stood time as the horizontal axis, now we have the received, the amount of received signal as the horizontal axis. And we can now unsuper in, in an unsupervised way to find all the genes that are, uh, that are kind of uh, differentially expressed due to cell-cell communication, right? As, uh, and as a result for this, again, for this DPP signaling example, uh, on the top, we plot the, the amount of received DPP signal in space. And these are the genes that we, we found that are differentially expressed due to DPP signaling, right? Some negative D genes, some positive D genes, and some uh, partial D genes, for example. Right? And uh, all this can be done in this uh, single line where we just uh, give it some key parameters. And there are also some uh, utilities that I didn't talk about. So uh, basically we have a, I have also implemented the first part of the talk into this package, uh, like integrating the spatial data and single cell data. So everything I talked about can be done using this ScanPy like API. And also with the ScanPy object that uh, and data that you get from a uh, common ScanPy pipeline so that uh, this can be similarly, uh, seamlessly used together with any scan pi pipeline for spatial data. And I will, uh, I will send Axel the, the, the exact uh, notebook uh, for all these analysis afterwards. And that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you. That was awesome. Um... I had a question. Um, what was it? So a lot of this talk kind of talks most like the theme of this talk seems to be that optimal transport is really nifty, rather than spatial transcriptomics is really nifty. And so my question to you is, um, after having wrestled with all this like different types of um, spatial data methods, do you would, do you have any preferences or opinions on which will kind of become like the de facto method in spatial transcriptomics? or which people should like gravitate towards when analyzing data? I think that depends on the question you want to ask. Right. Right. Uh, I think the most common ones are still these three. 
or the first two. Uh, if you want a, a, a decent depth in gene expression, you might want Vizio. If you want a, a kind of a balance between spatial resolution and gene expression, you want SciSeq. And if you're very picky about spatial resolution, you want you might want SigFish Plus. And also, right. I've heard SigFish Plus is very expensive, especially when you want to measure a large region. You, you need to do all those little batches separately. So those spatial batches, or those like you do the same experiment but with like different genes. Oh, spatial batches. The uh, oh, you cut Christ. the same same tissue into tiny pieces and do them one by one. Right, right, that's a pain. Sam wrote a question, which is, is it feasible to use your optimal transport analysis tool to infer cell-cell communication with Visium data, considering that Visium is not single cell resolution? Yeah, it is feasible, but uh, at least for that spatial trend of signaling, that vector field, I think that's easy to interpret. But the spot by spot matrix is kind of uh, hard to interpret in biology. It's kind of like you have a bunch of cells signaling to another bunch of cells, which, and to, to, to interpret that, you need some, uh, you can use some other analysis. There are a bunch of methods that can find the cell type convolution or cell type deconvolution of the spatial spot, for example, in Visum data, right? So to combine with that, I think the, Spot by spot signal matrix can also be easily interpreted. Any more questions for anyone? Otherwise, I'm just going to keep asking to send questions. <laughs> um, the takeaway of transport work is that. It effectively is a very powerful way of like method for data integration, right? Um, for instance, like your nature comms paper shows that really well. The sharing of work shows that really well for like time series data that it works. It works really well for effectively in the place of like pseudo time for like trajectory analysis. Um, is it possible to then extend optimal transport to do like full on hardcore like multimodal integration? Uh, that, that's a good point. That's uh, one thing we are currently working on. We're working on integrating two data sets without shared features. I think right. currently most methods re, uh, relies on the shared uh, features uh, between the, like the common genes, although they might have different meanings like from ATAC-seq and uh, RNA-seq. Now we're using optimal transport of course, not the traditional version with um, a topological method uh, to, uh, to, to integrate data sets without any shared features by simply looking at their geometric and topological structures. And does it naturally extend to more than two data sources? Yes, we haven't implemented that, but yes. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Jishan again. And thank you all for attending the past time of talks. It's really been a nice lineup. And we'll see you all again in whenever the next talk is. Um, until then, have a lovely summer. And yeah, take care, everyone. Stay and safe. Thanks, Just everyone. Just to be precise, our, our next talk is most probably going to be in the fall. Um, so, so we're not going to see you guys over the summer. However, we are in the process of planning an event that uh, we, we, we suspect will be very interesting to a lot of you. Um, so that's still in the works. That uh, more information will come out when we can. But this this will happen uh, maybe first week back of fall. So look out for that information. Cool.